We're back looking at Bible villains, a series we got going on looking at these Bible villains and how they picture the Antichrist. And this is part of an even bigger series called Fighting the Famine, where I'm trying to give you something every week to chew on and look at and study. That way you don't die from this self-inflicted famine that the Christian world has going on today. Now, historically, this guy Nimrod was a mighty hunter, and his kingdom was Babel. And most likely, this guy commissioned the building of the Tower of Babel. And the story that we're going to read also reveals God's feelings about a one-world government. Because pretty much Nimrod is heading a one-world government. Now, the doctrinal application is Nimrod is a type of the Antichrist, and this story pictures the future one world government. Now, practically, what can we get from it? Practically, we can see from this story that we should never join hands with the world to make ourselves a name. Rather, we should have unity among Bible believers to exalt the Lord's name. And this story is an example of what happens when you don't humble yourself. Now, Genesis 10, 8 through 10. It gives you something very little about Nimrod. It doesn't give hardly any details about Nimrod. Genesis 10, 8 through 10. And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Calne, and the land of Shinar. So we know he's king of Babel. So let's look at Genesis 11, where it talks about the Tower of Babel. So if he's king of Babel, obviously he probably commissioned the, the building of the Tower of Babel. Now look at Genesis 11, 1 through 9, and let's read the story. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now that we've read the story, let's see some similarities between Nimrod and the Antichrist. Number one, both Nimrod and the Antichrist are rebels. Nimrod's name itself means rebel. Nimrod is also the 13th from Adam. This is significant because the number 13 is the number of rebellion. And the first verse in your Bible that doesn't say the word God is Genesis 1, 13. The first time the word 13 is used in your Bible, it says in Genesis 14, 4, 12 years they served Chedorlaomer, and in the 13th year they rebelled. Notice that it says the word 13 and rebelled. The first time you see the word 13, it's got rebellion in the verse. In the first chapter 13 in the Bible, which would be Genesis 13, it really sheds some more light on the number. Genesis 13 and verse 13. It says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Notice that. Chapter 13, verse 13, and it has 13 words, and it's about Wicked sinners, which if, if you combine those two words, that's 13 letters. Homosexuality has 13 letters. And that's what the men of Sodom were, homosexuals. So you got some of the biggest rebels of all time, homosexuals, in Genesis 13, 
13, being called wicked sinners with 13 words in the verse. Uh, Judas Iscariot has 13 letters. The Antichrist is associated with the number 13. And one of the most revealing chapters on him is Revelation chapter 13. So the Antichrist, just like Nimrod, will rebel against the God of his fathers. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, talking about the Antichrist, it says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, if that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And then in Daniel eleven thirty seven, 37, once again, talking about the Antichrist, it says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. You see, he's a rebel. He rebels against anything to do with God, just like Nimrod. And rebellion is a dangerous thing. It says in 1 Samuel 15, 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It's one thing to rebel, but it's even worse to lead a rebellion. Extremely wicked men don't just rebel, but they lead a rebellion. Just like the devil, he's led many angels astray. In Revelation 12, 4, it says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. He did that in the past. He's going to do it again in, in the future. You need to remember that your rebellion could lead to a rebellion even unintentionally. Because the Bible says in Romans fourteen seven, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. You see, people see how you act, and it can affect their actions. Your rebellion could lead to a rebellion of a bunch of people. Now the next thing, Nimrod and the Antichrist are both from a cursed line. Remember that Noah cursed Canaan in Genesis 9 because of what his father Ham did to him there. And Nimrod is from that line. In Genesis 10, 6 through 8, it says, And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Phut, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Ramah, and Sabtika, and the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan, and Cush beget Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. So Nimrod came from the line of Ham and Canaan and was the son of Cush. So he's from a cursed line. And the Antichrist himself is the seed of the serpent. In Genesis 3.15, it shows us that the serpent also has a seed. Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is a solemn similarity between Nimrod and the Antichrist, both from a cursed line. The Antichrist is the seed of the serpent. But remember, just because you come from a bad family doesn't mean you have to continue the pattern. You can break the cycle. You can be like Gideon. He didn't have to follow the bell worship of his father, but he could have. But look what he did in Judges 6.25. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. You see, Gideon didn't follow that cycle of shame and sin. He broke the cycle. You know, Nimrod didn't have to go with that cycle. He was part of a cursed line. And the Antichrist, when it comes right down to it, he doesn't have to follow the curse on himself. He could be good, choose of his own free will to do good, but God sees through his foreknowledge that he's not going to. Similar to Pharaoh, you know, he didn't have to harden his heart initially, initially but God saw that he would. You see, break the cycle of sin in your family line. Maybe you come from a long line of drug use, alcoholism. You know, you know, maybe the men in your family have all went to prison. You know, you can break the cycle of sin in your family line. But both Nimrod and the Antichrist come from a cursed line. Number three, Nimrod and the Antichrist are both mighty men. In Genesis 10, 8 through 9, it says, And Cush beget Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And Daniel 8, 24 prophesies about the Antichrist and says, And his power shall be mighty. 
but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and shall and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. It makes sense because men are impressed by superhuman ability. This is why athletes are so popular. Men to see, men love to see other men doing things that most humans can't do. Notice it was the people who were saying, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. The people were saying that. Notice what they say about the Antichrist in Revelation 13 and verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, saying, who is like unto the beast who was able to make war with him? So what do they say? Who is like the beast? Who can make war with this beast? Notice that's what the people were saying, just like the people bragged on Nimrod and said, a mighty hunter before the Lord. They brag on the Antichrist and say, who's able to make a war with this guy? You know what they call the great athletes today? You know, when an NBA player dunks on a, another player, they say, wow, that man is a beast. Uh, what do they do in the tribulation? They worship the beast. You see, you might be a mighty man according to the world's standards. Maybe you're like Naaman, you know, in Second Kings 5.1. Now, Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had deliver, given deliverance unto Syria. He, he was also a mighty man in valor. Notice all these great things about him. A mighty man. Then the last thing. But he was a leper. Naaman had all this stuff going for him, but he was still a leper. You see, you, you uh, may have more talent and ability than the average man, but Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if you're the strongest man in the world, there will still always be somebody stronger than you because you're not stronger than God. And God said himself in Isaiah 44, 8, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Your flesh is grass. Your body is food for the maggots. In 1 Peter 1, 24, it says, For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of men as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. You might as well use every bit of strength and power that you have to exalt Jesus Christ because it's worthless otherwise. Both Nimrod and the Antichrist are mighty men. You might be a mighty man according to the world's standards, but you're still going to die and go to hell if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, another thing, Nimrod and the Antichrist both hunt men. Nimrod was a mighty hunter. Now, I don't believe Nimrod just hunted animals. It may have started out that way, but I think he moved on to bigger game. I mean, if he didn't physically, we know he did at least spiritually speaking. Look how many people he would have led astray with his one world government leading people away from the Lord. But the reason I think he moved on to bigger game and started hunting men instead of animals is because I searched the words hunt hunter and hunted in the Bible. And these are the verses that I came up with. You see, these verses are about men who hunt other men. There's something terrifying about a man who hunts other men. It can almost be as scary or more scary than uh, some type of monster who hunts men. I mean, what disturbs you more, Freddy Krueger or Jeffrey Dahmer? I mean, I think the real serial killers are a lot more disturbing. In Proverbs 6, 5, it says, Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. So it says, Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter. A man is hunting another man. In Proverbs six twenty six, For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. The adulteress just goes around and hunts for the precious life. Lamentations 4.18, they hunt our steps, that we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near, our day is fulfilled, our end is come. They're so hunted that they can't go in the streets. I mean, you even see that in America and places today. Sometimes you can't even go out in the street in some places because men are hunting other men. 
In Micah 7, 2, the good man is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. In Jeremiah 5, 26, it says, For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait as he that setteth snares. They set a trap. They catch men. So these, these hunters in the Bible are hunting men. And in the tribulation, what would the Antichrist do? He's going to cause all to take his mark and worship him. And those who don't will be beheaded or in hiding. They will be hunted. And it says in Matthew twenty four fifteen through 16, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. That's when the Antichrist will go sit in the temple and claim to be God. And then the Jews are going to be like, no, you're not God, and they're going to run. It says, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. They're going to be running because they're going to be hunted. We have men today who hunt men. They hunt women and children, the sex traffickers, the rapists, the pedophiles, and everything else. The devil has all kinds of men hunting men in this physical world, as well as getting them to sell out to him spiritually. You have Disney who is on the hunt for the soul of the of the child that wants to affect them at a young age, get them ready to get involved in sexual sin at a young age. Just like the devil has men hunt men, we ourselves as believers need to be hunting men for the glory of God. You see... In Matthew 4, 19, Jesus saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. We need to be out there trying to get men out of the devil's net. Bring them out of the deeps with the gospel net. And that's why the devil hates a soul winner. You are taking his children, who he was just going to use for a microwave meal, but when you catch them, you clean them, and then you show them how to walk. The devil just wants them to stay dirty and flop around. But you catch them and clean them, you show them how to walk. And another similarity between Nimrod and the Antichrist is both are kings. Genesis 10, 8 through 10, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Calne, in the land of Shinar. Nimrod's a king. The Antichrist is a king. It says in Revelation 16, 10, The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Both of them are evil kings. Not only that, but they are both associated with Babylon. Nimrod is king of Babel, and the Antichrist is shacked up with that great whore, Mystery Babylon. Look at Revelation 17, 1 through 3. It says, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So the Antichrist is shacked up with the Roman Catholic Church, at least for a time, and this is Mystery Babylon the Great. And in Nahum 3, 4, it talks about her, and it says, Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts, that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. So she's a hoe and a witch, this Mystery Babylon, that's the Roman Catholic Church, is a hoe and a witch, and bad guys like wicked women. Behind every wicked man is usually a wicked woman, and according to legends, Nimrod had Semiramis, the wicked woman behind him. Ahab had Jezebel. You see, don't get mixed up in a cult-like, self-righteous, wicked religion like Mystery Babylon. Uh, you see, who was the ones who hated the Lord the most? Those religious scribes and Pharisees. That's who hated the Lord the most. And both Nimrod and the Antichrist are associated with Babylon. Both Nimrod and the Antichrist unite the world against God. 
That's the next, next one. Both of them unite the world against God. You see, back there when Nimrod commissioned the building of the Tower of Babel, it says in Genesis 11, 1, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. You see, everyone was together. There was one language. He had it all, one government, one religion. They were united. Nimrod probably had a coexist sticker on his back window. I mean, he was a rough character, but he probably used the rainbow sign as a pride thing. Uh, Noah, his grandpa, you know, Noah was his grandfather, probably grabbed him by the ear for that. You know, he, uh, he was around a preacher of righteousness, you know. But he still went this bad way. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them through thee. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. Look at how many times they say the word us. Go to, let us make brick. And they, then they said in the next verse, in verse 4, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth so many us's and we's it was all about them united they were strong but they were trying to be strong without god they were most likely building this building to reach the clouds to get the door open for those sons of god to come back down and there seems to be something about those clouds and getting back and forth from the third heaven to the earth for example, in Acts 1, 9, it says, And when he had spoken these things, while well, they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. You see, when the Lord ascended to heaven, a cloud received him out of their sight. And when the Lord comes back in Revelation 1, 7, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. So there's something about those clouds. And Nimrod had everyone united. They probably said, United we stand. The Antichrist will also have all people unite under him. He's going to want a one-world government, one-world religion, one-world monetary system, and eventually will cause all to worship him or else. It says in Revelation 13, 11 through 12, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. This is referring to the false prophet. He causes people to worship the beast, the Antichrist. And he's going to be for the Antichrist what John the Baptist was for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says in Revelation 13, 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in sight of men. Imagine the masses going crazy, seeing this all over social media, all over the news. I mean, if Will Smith leaving his fresh prints all over Chris Rock's face blows up the news and social media the way it did, imagine how viral this guy's going to be. It says in Revelation thirteen fourteen, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So not only is the Antichrist going to have superhuman abilities, but his henchmen will also have superhuman abilities. It says in verse 15, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. It wouldn't be anything for man today to worship an image. I mean, they do it all ready. They worship their own image. But notice how you will unite under the beast or else you'll be killed. In Revelation thirteen sixteen seventeen, it says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So you will have a choice. You won't be forced against your will to take it, but the other choice will be death. You take it or you die. If you're forced to take it, it wouldn't take. It wouldn't work because you also have to worship the beast. There has to be worship there. It says in verse 18, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is six hundred three score and six. So not only do you have to take the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name, you got to worship him. And Nimrod and the Antichrist... This is the next one. Nimrod and the Antichrist both want to make themselves a name. 
It says in Genesis 11, 4, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name. They make themselves a name, all right. I mean, look up Nimrod in the dictionary, and it says someone who is inept. And as a kid, I remember people calling each other Nimrod when they were acting like idiots. They'd say, you're such a Nimrod. You know, that's the Lord's sense of humor. They wanted to make themselves a name, and the Lord made their name into a slang word for an idiot. Uh, consider also the name Babel. Why do people say a drunk, you know, when you know when a drunk's acting up and acting stupid and can't hardly talk, what do they say he's doing? Well, in Proverbs twenty three twenty nine, it says about him, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling? You know, when somebody can't even hardly speak, they say, you're just babbling. You see, the Babel really made themselves a name. What you, what you need to do is focus on exalting on the name of the Lord, not on your own name. But it says in Philippians 2, 9 through 10, Wherefore God hath also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. If you focus on exalting the Lord, he will eventually exalt you. Maybe not in this life, but in the world to come. And 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. The Antichrist will want to make a name for himself and exalt himself above all that is called God. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, He opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I mean, if the man won't let you buy or sell without his name, he's definitely exalting his own name. It says in Revelation thirteen seventeen that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. He's making himself a name is what he's going to do. Both Nimrod and the Antichrist, this is the next one, both Nimrod and the Antichrist show up right before a language change. You see, when Nimrod had this one world thing going on, everyone spoke the same language. They could really put their heads together and get things done. But when the Lord saw what they were trying to accomplish, he came down and did something to stop it. It says in Genesis eleven seven, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So people had so much unity against God. If someone got up and cursed God, they'd be like, Now this guy is speaking my language. You see, their language was curse God, uh, unite against God. That, that was speaking their language. Now, Genesis eleven eight through 9, So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So the Lord came down and made everyone speak different languages. They couldn't work together. They had to spread out and go with the people who spoke their language. And this is what they were supposed to do anyway. They were supposed to spread out. You see, God doesn't like everyone getting together because then they think they don't need God anymore. The only unity God wants is unity among the saints. It says in Psalm 133, 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You see, when saints unite, they unite under God. But when these wicked men unite, they unite against God. God changes their language. Nimrod shows up right before a language change, just like the Antichrist shows up right before a language change. It says in Zephaniah 3, 9, prophecy of something that's coming in the future. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. After the Lord throws the Antichrist in the bottomless pit, he's going to turn it back to a pure language. Nimrod showed up right before a name change. The Antichrist showed up right, is going to show up right before a name change. The next one, both Nimrod and the Antichrist are on the throne when the Lord comes down. In Genesis eleven seven, it says, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord came down to Babel in Nimrod's day, and the Lord is going to come down while the Antichrist is on the throne as well. In Revelation nineteen twenty through 21, he comes down, kills the Antichrist, and throws him into a bottomless pit. Well, throws him to a lake of fire, sorry, and throws the uh, Satan into a bottomless pit. 
Who will be on the throne of your heart when Revelation 19 happens? Are you going to be in the Lord's army fighting with him? Or are you going to be on the receiving end of the fire and the sword? And now the, the next thing, the last thing, both the Antichrist and Nimrod have a wicked imagination. You see, right before the Lord came down, he saw that every man's imagination was running wild. In Genesis eleven six, it said, And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Nimrod had a wicked imagination. The Antichrist will have a wicked imagination. In Nahum, Nahum 1, 11, the prophecy of the Antichrist, it says, There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. You see, they both have dirty imaginations. You need to control your imagination. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought to the obedience of Christ. Cast down your wicked imaginations. But now the last thing is in Genesis chapter 11, 10 through 32. The rest of the chapter is about the line of Shem and Abraham. So after the Lord came down and wiped out Nimrod and his one world government, the rest of the chapter was about those Jews. Now, they weren't Jews yet, but with this man Abram, God was going to begin formulating the nation of Israel and tell Abraham that he was giving him the land. Compare this with how when the Lord comes down at the second coming and gets rid of the Antichrist and his one world government, like he did Nimrod's, he will then give Israel the land that he promised them. It's just something to me how that lays out in such a similar order. But if you've took notes and listened to this, in about 30 minutes, you've did a character study on the anti, um, uh, Nimrod, partly on the Antichrist. You've went over 50 to 60 verses, part of two chapters, and hopefully got something to chew on for the week.